Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com. Good morning, everybody. This is Amala Efanovi hosting the Dennis Prager radio show this morning. I know what you're thinking. This is not Dennis. He sounds awfully feminine. He has not transitioned. This is, in fact, a 22-year-old female talking to you right now and currently an employee at PragerU, Dennis's organization. So for those of you who don't know me, I am a former radical leftist. I was crazy about four years ago because I was just consumed with the idea of leftist ideology. It's what I grew up with. And by virtue of being a biracial female living in America, I was super susceptible to the idea that I was oppressed in this country for numerous reasons. So... I wanted to talk today, not about my story, because I've, I've said that story every single time I've hosted the radio show. I want to talk about what changed uh, in this first hour when I realized that maybe leftist ideology was not for me, and I went through this wake-up call. At first, I was extremely angry, as you can imagine, because I had believed these ideas all throughout my life up until about 18 years of age. And to see that all crumble away and realize maybe I'd been fighting for something that wasn't for me was a devastating realization. But at the other end of it, I felt super fulfilled in knowing that maybe I wasn't as oppressed as I once believed that I was. Maybe there was a a silver lining to this country that I had not seen before. So completely had a a change around in my life and in my entire mentality and more so than that in my identity. I found that when I was on the left end of things, who I identified as or who I thought I was was so very superficial. I was consumed with my skin color, I was consumed with my sex, I was consumed with pondering sexuality and just really thinking that these superficial identity markers that really don't say anything about who you are as an individual were super important and I had made them pivotal in my life. So all of my conversations I structured around that identity that I had created for myself, all of my woes I had structured around that identity, and all of my wins I structured around that identity by virtue of being an activist and protesting and you know, doing grassroots organizing and working with students and convincing them of their superficial identities. And when I realized that that was not, in fact, who I was, I had a major question to ask myself. In fact, many major questions to ask myself. But one of those questions was, who are you? Who are you if not a biracial female? Who are you if if not somebody oppressed by patriarchy? Who are you if not somebody who is a victim of systemic racism? And I had to sort of reconcile my past and work through finding out what my true morals and values were, where I stood philosophically in my relationship to the world, and I still haven't answered the the question. And I think it's an ongoing question that we seek answers to throughout our entire lives. But that was what I had to grapple with at around 17, 18, when I went through this realization. And not just so much that the conservative identity is all encapsulating, but just stepping out of leftism and and the woke identity is such a powerful thing. It, It makes you truly think, who am I without my problems? Because so much of leftism is focused on centering yourself around problems, around struggles, around oppression. So that's a question that I had to grapple with. On top of that, I found that so many things about my thinking changed when I stepped outside of my echo chamber and started to question the world and my relationship with it. When I was 
a leftist. I had no reverence for tradition, for history, for this country's past. And that lack of understanding of tradition and history and this country's past actually led me to vitriol and hate for this country. Because when you have a shallow understanding of the history of the place you're in, your views on it will be shallow. So I had lots of hatred towards the, the country. I viewed its history very pessimistically. And when I started to question those narratives and beliefs, I realized, oh, two things can exist at once. I can recognize the transgressions that, this hist that we have in our history here in this country and acknowledge that those were not great things that happened in this country's past, but also have a view of progress. We've, we've progressed out of those transgressions. We've gone further than any other civilization in doing good for our society and, and for humans in general. So two ideas can exist at once. I don't have to have this completely pessimistic view of our history. And in fact, I'm robbing myself of looking at human existence in a more powerful and progressive way when you view the world so pessimistically. So that changed for me. And then my, my mindset towards change and progress changed quite a bit. When I was on the left, so much of what I wanted to do was leave a mark on the world, change the world. I wanted to be the young person who brought about a revolution, flipped everything on its head, and, and transformed everything. You know, when uh, Barack Obama was elected to president, he said he was going to be the most transformative president in American history. And at the time hearing that, you go, that's so wonderful. How powerful is that? He's going to bring about a revolution. And now when I look at change, I think change is going to happen. Change is not always bad. It's not something that we should try to, to stop necessarily, but it can happen in more of an evolutionary manner rather than a revolutionary manner. I think we all have the capacity to do good things. I think as humans, we are naturally moving towards progress and innovation, and we don't each of us have to be some sort of transformative energy on the world that is changing everything and flipping everything on its head all the time. But activists will tell you the exact opposite. I was constantly going around and talking to young people about how they were going to be the change in the world, that it started now, that it had to be the most forceful and radical thing that we could possibly push through. And now I look back and I'm just telling myself, slow down, <laughs> slow down. Change is, is going to come, as Sam Cooke sings. It will happen and humans naturally make change occur. Now, you can be a driver for it and, of course, push for, for progress, but it doesn't have to flip everything on its head all of the time. So I went from revolutionary thinking to evolutionary thinking, which is quite ironic because uh, most people view conservatives and think uh, they couldn't possibly concern themselves with the idea of evolution. But <laughs> I was very concerned with the idea of evolution in going through this change. And lastly, my relationship with society, with the people around me in my community, and really with the world changed. I, as a young person, was so focused on controlling the world, controlling the things around me, controlling what people thought, what they felt, what they said. And we know that wokeism is a major driver of control and convincing people that they should be able to control others. And I was constantly affirmed in that belief. When I was a teenager, I was living in central Florida and the Parkland shooting happened, which was devastating and horrifying. And I was in high school at the time. So it hit hard for everybody that was around me, for my mother, my grandparents, of course, everybody across the country and really around the world was, was feeling the dev devastation in the wake of what happened there. And on the heels of the Parkland shooting came the March for Our Lives. And I thought no better group to get involved with in March for Our Lives. We need to do something now. We need to be revolutionary and we need to flip everything on its head. So I got the offer and opportunity to speak at the March for Our Lives in Orlando. And I went and did that. And I believe I was 16, 17 at the time and spoke to thousands of people who had come together in Orlando to talk about this collective struggle that we were working and, and trying and striving for, you know, changing the Second Amendment and working on revolutionary gun control. And 
everybody reinforced this idea that young people were going to be the future, they were going to control the narrative, and we were going to push this revolutionary change. And now I think, okay, <laughs> the change is going to come. I think people are, are feeling it. We hopefully will be able to sit down and at the table and compromise and, and move things along, but not everything needs to be controlled all the time. Now I look at the world and I go, how can I understand my place within it? I am but a small blip on the timeline of human existence. Why do I feel the need to control the world? And what a narcissistic view that is to hold as just being one individual. So now I'm trying to understand my place in the world and understand my relationship with the people around me. So that's changed immensely for me. You can hear more about my story by checking out my show, Unapologetic Live. It's on all podcast platforms and on YouTube.com. Check it out. I'd like to tell you about a new film that I highly recommend, and more importantly, God, is this true? Mrs. Prager recommends it. Nefarious is a spiritual thriller from the filmmakers behind God's Not Dead and Unplanned. It's excellent, well-acted, suspenseful, and scary in all the right places. It's like C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. But much more than that, it is a powerful reminder that the battle between good and evil, ultimately between God and Satan, is being fought not just around us, but within us. What better way to bring God into the marketplace than through the movies? In a world that calls good evil and evil good, nefarious is a kind of red pill. That also happens to taste good, especially if you enjoy a good roller coaster ride. Nefarious is the kind of smart, thoughtful filmmaking we want to support and promote. Film opens in theaters nationwide starting April 14th. Take a moment to buy your tickets today at whoisnefarious.com. For you, you can check out any of my stuff by going to prayeryou.com or checking out Unapologetic Live on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. I want to dedicate, I think, this whole hour to this subject matter. If you guys know me, you know I get really riled up when it comes to the conversation about gender and specifically as it pertains to children because I think children deserve to be fought for. They're the most vulnerable in our society and right now we are in a, a cultural battle with people who I think most of whom believe they're doing the right thing but are just so deeply misguided by ideology and dogma when it comes to this subject matter. And one of those people is Harry Potter star Daniel Radcliffe. If you guys are fans of Harry Potter, you'll know him as playing Harry Potter in uh, the movies and series. He recently hosted an event with the Trevor Project. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Trevor Project, it's an LGBTQ plus organization that uh, promotes, of course, all of their movements and narratives. One of those narratives being transitioning children and allowing children to essentially mutilate themselves. So Daniel Radcliffe had, uh, I guess, the honor and privilege of sitting down with six different trans youths in a video that has now been released where he discusses their gender transition and says, quote, that we should trust kids to tell us who they are. And I can see how somebody would fall for this idea, how somebody would be sympathetic to this idea. Trust kids to tell us who they are. Because, of course, everybody has a deeper sense of themselves than other people do outside of their own bodies and their own minds. But kids are children. <laughs> There's a reason we don't allow them to do things like get tattoos, drink, uh, consent to medical operations, consent to any sort of sexual uh, encounters with anybody. There's a reason that kids are not allowed to make these decisions, and it's because they're not yet in the mind state. They don't have the mental faculties to make a decision like this yet. So why have we thrown all of that logic and reasoning out the window when it comes to gender transition? Now, it's interesting and really enlightening to actually watch this video, although you would probably think otherwise. Daniel sits down with these kids and asks them a multitude of questions regarding their gender transition, how they knew deep down who they truly were, and the answers that are given by these children are so juvenile that in watching this, it just dispels all of the reasoning that the left is using to justify what is happening to children right now. One young girl talks about, at the age of 11 years old, well, she's, now, she's really a biological boy, so a biological boy who has now transitioned to be a girl, and I will say seems to have done it pre, 
uh, puberty, possibly, because it looks like a very convincing young woman, is saying, you know, when I was a boy, I was told constantly that I am a male deep down ever since I was born. And at the age of 11 years old, I looked around me and I thought, I don't really like the color blue. I don't like superheroes. I don't like sports. So deep down, I knew that something was wrong, that I was feeling some sort of incongruence with my gender and my assigned sex. Think about that reasoning. You're simply a boy who doesn't like superheroes, doesn't like sports, doesn't like the color blue. You're still a boy. And to hear it from the horse's mouth of a young child who was grappling with these ideas, but was then pushed down the route of medical transition is really horrifying to hear and very disheartening to hear. Now, another trans child in this video echoes the exact same sentiments as that young boy and says, you know, our stories are very much the same. I went through similar reasoning. I felt a similar incongruence with my mind and my body, and I decided to transition. And then says something really powerful and powerful not because it's profound or because it, it means anything, but powerful because it's so interesting how deeply we can believe in lies. This uh, now transitioned woman or trans woman says, I've lived longer in a female body than I've lived in a male body. If that is not proof that I am a woman, I don't know what else is. Of course, I'm paraphrasing the, the, the actual statement there. But think about what that actually means, what is actually being said. I've lived in the lie long enough to where it has convinced me that I am living in truth. That's essentially what's being said there. And of course, that is juvenile reasoning because these are juveniles who are going through this process and who are being aimed in the direction of mutilating their bodies and causing this irreparable damage. And something really dark occurred to me when I was watching this video. Daniel Radcliffe is sitting down with six trans youths and statistically, at least one to two of these individuals is likely to attempt suicide or even be successful at suicide at some point in their lives. Yet Daniel Radcliffe, the star of Harry Potter, who has a deeply entrenched influence with young people, not just in America, but all across the world, has decided that the statement he wants to make is that trans children should be affirmed in their delusion and in this belief. The most vulnerable in our society should be pushed down the route of delusion. And he largely chose this subject because as we all know, the writer of Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling, came out and spoke out against trans uh, individuals, saying that she wanted to protect women, that she wanted to stop the erasure of women, and that was the hill that she was going to die on as the author of this great work. Now, immediately, Daniel Radcliffe and other stars in the Harry Potter series came out to denounce what she had said and said that they don't agree with her, that they stand with trans people. And now he's gone the most radical route possible to sit down with trans kids and blindly affirm their beliefs. It just blows my mind to see a celebrity endorsement of this. And Tom Soule, who I am a major fan of, talks about intellectuals. Not that I would go as far as to say that Daniel Radcliffe is an intellectual, but he talks about how the impact that intellectuals leave on society, they never get the repercussions of it. Nobody's going to check in with Daniel Radcliffe in 20 years and tell him the outcomes of these children and say, remember when you sat down with them and gave your brilliant endorsement of this behavior and of this activity to vulnerable children? Do you remember when that happened? You're never going to have that moment. It's very similar, in fact, I think, to the opioid crisis that struck the United States of America. Back in 1998, these big pharma, these big pharma companies uh, and these pharmaceutical corporations were putting out ads about how wonderful it was to be on OxyContin and how all of these people who were dealing with chronic pain throughout their lives and didn't know how to deal with it were now overjoyed to be on this new miracle drug that instantly took away their pain. Now, were those big pharma corporations taken to task 20 years later when we check back in with those people and they are deceased or just ridden with addiction and just the struggle that comes along with addiction? No, but we can still go back and reference those 1998 commercials of them talking about how wonderful it was to be placed on this path. That's what we're doing to children now. 
Think of the trans crisis right now as the opioid crisis, and the outcomes are going to be horrific. We need to protect children. We need to stand by their side. They are vulnerable. Now, I talk about this issue more in depth on my show, on Apologetic Live. You can check it out by going to PragerU.com or YouTube, and I go in depth. As you can tell, I'm very passionate about this, and we're going to talk about it more when we come back. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better, Mike Lindell with My Pillow is launching the My Pillow 2.0. When Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could ever want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he discovered a new technology that makes it even better. The MyPillow 2.0 has the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, and now with a brand new fabric that is made with a temperature-regulating thread. The MyPillow 2.0 is the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. For my listeners, the MyPillow 2.0 is buy one, get one free offer with promo code PRAGER. MyPillow 2.0 temperature regulating technology is 100% made in the USA and comes with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Just go to MyPillow.com and click on the radio listeners square to the buy one, get one free offer. Enter promo code Prager or call 800-761-6302 to get your MyPillow 2.0 now. I'm coming. Listen to that soothing voice of Dennis Prager. I'm Amala Epinobi, your sit-in host, and I want to let you know Dennis will be back tomorrow. Don't be alarmed by those uh, pesky tan lines. They will fade with time, I promise. (laughs) Uh, I wanted to go deeper into this gender conversation that we're having here and talk about some ways that we can combat what's happening. I, as a biological woman, (laughs) feel the need to really denounce some of the new terminology that is being birthed out of this movement. Things like cisgendered. Have you guys heard that term, cisgendered? I've been called a cisgendered woman I don't know how many times now. And funnily enough, this phrase has only popped up within the last few years. But a cisgender woman being somebody born biologically a woman who continues to identify as a woman. Birthing person. You guys have heard that one, right? Chest feeding as opposed to to breastfeeding. Sex assigned at birth. That's a new phrase. (laughs) Sex assigned at birth. Who would have thought we would ever hear that? That, you know what? Sex is not some sort of binary characteristic that we are given upon conception. But in fact, it is assigned by a medical doctor at birth. That's how that all works. Now, I recently, of course, went out of my way to reject the term cisgendered and said I'm not a cis woman. I'm just a woman. And many were not happy to hear that whatsoever. I was doing an interview yesterday uh, across from a trans woman, and they had read out this statement of me saying I am not a cis woman. I am simply a woman. It's as simple as that. And when asked for a response from the trans woman, she just said, or I should say he said, I'm not going to even dignify that with a response. And to me, that signals that there's just simply no argument against that. There's simply no argument and that they're don't, they don't have a strong supportive backing for the things that they believe. They are simply being led by emotions and feelings. And it seems to be plaguing women and the female space far more than it is plaguing men. And I think there is a multitude of reasons for that. First of all, I don't think men feel at all threatened by a woman who is pretending to be them. Uh, They're certainly not going to go around stealing their sports competition wins or anything like that. So they have nothing to worry about there. They certainly can't overpower them in male spaces. So they're not worried about them there. But with women, I am seeing all of these Famous trans women who are now coming to light. We'll talk about sponsorships in the next segment and different uh, companies that are allowing this to happen. Recently, I saw an ad for a company called Burdette Lingerie. (laughs) And the tagline on their lingerie is lingerie for women by women. And you go to their Instagram page, which I don't recommend any of you do, but you will see a grown man pictured wearing this lingerie. Again, Google at your own risk uh, there. (laughs) Google at your own risk, but you will see a grown man wearing lingerie, even a bra. 
no breasts on this man, but he is wearing a bra in this photo <laughs> for a lingerie company made by women for women. We are living in the upside down. I I swear it. <laughs> but I saw Candace Owens actually go on Twitter yesterday and make an interesting statement that I had to think about. She said only women are emotional enough and manipulated uh, or easily manipulated enough to allow these movements like the body positivity movement and the trans movement to completely usurp their power and standing in society. And I sat and thought about it for a minute and I certainly think that that could be one of the factors here. We as women are very compassionate, nurturing, we want to be accepting, we want others to feel good about themselves, and we are willing to let that feeling drive us even if it commits to our erasure. Now, not all women are doing this, and in this hour we'll talk about women who are doing the work to support and, and to stop the erasure of women in our society, but we do have this proclivity to just want to accept all things, even when it infringes on our rights. And it is infringing on our rights in many ways. We'll talk about Riley Gaines, an NCAA swimmer, who talks about Leah Thomas derobing in their female locker room, which is something that no woman should have to go through. But we as women have to reject these terms. We can't let the nurturing, compassionate nature of our bodies overtake our logic, and our reasoning. And we need to start talking about this. You can check out more of what I have to say at PragerU.com. And if you'd like to support our content, consider going to PragerU.com slash donate. Right, good morning. I'm your sit-in host, Amala Ethanovi. For those of you who don't know me, I work at PragerU. You can check out my show, Unapologetic Live, by going to all podcast platforms and I'm all over social media. You just got to figure out how to spell my name, Amala Ethanovi. Now, I wanted to get into this recent viral exchange that is now all over the internet. Elon Musk, you all know him as a Tesla SpaceX billionaire who now also owns Twitter which he acquired in a $44 billion deal. He recently sat down with a BBC reporter to discuss what has happened in the wake of him buying Twitter. And the BBC reporter had some very bold claims to assert to Elon Musk. I want to listen to this. This is a, a over two-minute exchange, but it is well worth listening to. Let's hear that. Content you don't like or, or hateful? What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit a, a reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist, those kinds of those kinds of things. So you think if I'm, something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? I, no, is that I'm what you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con content, and I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if, and you just said that if something is slightly sexist, that's hateful content. Does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me, you've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's what I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't need, I, I, honestly, you I don't. You can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why, because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore, because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you said actually, a lot of people, a lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only, well, well, I only look well, at my, on a second. My you said you've following. seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example, not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks, and I. Well, then, how did you see the hateful content? content? Because I've been, I've been using, I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you, for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right, and, and I, you can't I, give us a single one. And, and, and I'm saying, I, I, then I, I say, sir, that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con a content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed, you just lied. What no, no. What I claim was uh, there are many uh, organisations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my feed or not, give me one example. Not, 
I mean, I, right, and you can, can look at something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK. They will say that. So you, they, Look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right, and as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know? Let, that I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content and then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I, That's haven't, absurd. I, haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then would how would you know this hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We, have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, wow. Well, Oof, did you hear that? Oh, what a humbling experience for that reporter at the BBC. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move on. And you know what? I really feel for him because that was my entire life as a left-leaning activist. Constantly, people would come to me and have all of these different things that they wanted to battle with me back and forth. And I really had no information to back up the claims that I was making. I simply just felt this moral impulse to make those specific claims. And that's what happened to this BBC reporter. He was told that Elon Musk was this evil villain who has no idea what he's doing in running a company and that now Twitter is just running amok with racists and, and homophobes and transphobes. And now they're all over the platform because Elon Musk has emboldened him. And he felt so strongly about that moral impulse and that moral belief that he didn't take the time to substantiate it. And that's really what we're dealing with right now is a bunch of people who have very strong moral impulses and opinions, but are not taking the time to do a hefty amount of research, not even a hefty amount of research that would have taken minimal research in order to find one example of a hate comment on Twitter. Now, I'm of the opinion that even hate speech is protected speech. It's even hard to define hate speech, which we'll talk about later, but Sure, there are hateful commenters on every single social media platform that you can think of. He would not have been hard-pressed to find somebody who was leaving a, quote, hate comment on Twitter, but he couldn't even drive himself to do that. That's how overwhelmed he is by his own moral impulses and his own righteousness, <laughs> that he does not feel the need to even defend the beliefs that he's putting forward. And just... The state of journalism today, this, this video is completely emblematic of the state of journalism today. There is no journalistic integrity. It used to be that journalists approached their stories trying to find truth, engaging with a healthy amount of skepticism within their own minds, and really trying to dig deep to find the deeper narratives, find the underbelly of the stories. A brilliant thing this reporter could have done is sat down with Elon Musk and said, you know what? This was a $44 billion deal, and you really paid a price that Twitter was not worth in order to acquire this company. Why did you feel the need to do that? Why would you take a business deal that is really not within your best interest, at least not at this very moment? Why do you feel so strongly about that? Why do you describe yourself as a free, spree a free speech absolutist? Why do you feel this is something we need to defend? But no. He can set aside his own ideology for however long this interview is to really get down to the root of why somebody would make a decision like that, why somebody would want to protect free speech, and why they felt Twitter was the perfect target to do so. And I can tell you exactly why. It's because Twitter is capable of controlling the American mind if utilized in the wrong way and if in the hands of the wrong people. There is a brilliant documentary called The Creepy Line that I encourage everybody to watch about Google specifically and how Google framed itself as this hub of information but is capable of subtly and not so subtly shaping everything that you believe and injecting your mind with bias through their search engine capabilities. Twitter has that very same effect on people. You can choose what's headline news. You can choose what people see and you can essentially fabricate feelings towards any given subject matter. They have a deep power to influence elections and simply how we feel about any given news story, as well as control information and stop it from getting out to the American people. Mark Zuckerberg, who we know controls Meta, Facebook, and Instagram, came forward and said, yeah, you know, when this whole Hunter Biden laptop thing happened, the FBI reached out to me directly and said, can we can we hold off on this information getting out to the public or at least shadow ban the people who are trying to put it out there? And of course, Mark Zuckerberg towed the line of the U.S. government and did exactly that. Do we think the same thing's not happening on Twitter? 
And maybe that's why this BBC reporter is so hellbent on pushing a narrative that Twitter is overwhelmed by hate in the wake of Elon Musk owning the platform, because he can't bear to see a platform that is actually pushing for free speech, that is actually fact checking people, even going as far as to fact check the president of the United States. Uh, recently, Joe Biden tweeted out about the gender wage gap and was immediately fact-checked by the community fact-check ma managers at Twitter uh, right below his tweet. And that's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing to tell people that, yes, this person has power by virtue of being the president of the United States, but we're also going to keep the facts straight here. And you deserve, as a user of this platform, to know what is factual and what it's not. And we will do this impartially across the board for both sides of the political aisle to let you know where the objective facts lie on any given issue. But the institutions that be and the powers that be don't want to see that happen. You have way too much control and way too much power if you know what's actually going on, if you have the objective facts. Knowledge is power. It, it truly, it truly is. That is something, that's a phrase that the left uses a lot, and that's certainly a phrase that they, that they get right. Knowledge is power. The pursuit of knowledge is power. And at every turn, these social media platforms and big corporations are trying to stop you in your pursuit of knowledge. And it's funny that this BBC reporter is overwhelmed by the hatred that he, he describes as being present on Twitter, but can't think of a single example. A quick thought experiment for all of you who are listening right now. Think about a time that someone said something truly hateful to you, something that truly struck you in the heart. I bet something comes to mind, and I bet you can remember it quite easily. If this man was experiencing any form of hate on Twitter, I'd venture to say he'd remember it. <laughs> he'd remember what hate and vitriol feels like, but he can't because he's not experiencing it. He simply subscribed himself to the narrative and is defending an institution like the BBC, which I'm sure is well accustomed to lying to the people who listen to or watch or read their media. And he's fearful of that position of power being lost. And if I have anything to do with it, if Elon has anything to do with it, it will be lost. We need to change the media landscape and start moving towards people who we can actually trust to give us information. Not necessarily trust with objectivity or to always have the facts straight, but we can trust they're not trying to pull one over on us. Now, if you'd like to hear more from me, you can check out Unapologetic Live on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. Plus, go to PragerU.com. Stop the things you do. And we're back. Good morning. I'm your sit-in host, Amala Epinobi from PragerU. You know, Dennis is going to be back tomorrow to talk to you all, tan lines and all. And Dennis often talks about fabricated racism in the United States of America and that how real acts of racism happen so seldomly that people have to make them up. We have the acts of Bubba Wallace, you know, that race car driver who said there was a noose hanging in his garage. Uh, come to find out that wasn't the case and, and certainly was not uh, what was happening in that situation. Jussie Smollett, who was racistly attacked by two white men screaming, this is MAGA country and pouring bleach on him and throwing a, a noose around him. But it actually turned out to be two black men who he hired to commit this act so that he could rise to fame more expeditiously. And now we have another story. <laughs> this is coming out of Florida State University. Here's the headline from humanevents.com. Black FSU professor resigns in disgrace amid allegations that he faked data on commonality of racism and had six papers retracted. Now, this is a criminology professor at Florida State University who has now suddenly left his lucrative position after it was discovered that he skewed statistical data to make racism seem more prevalent than it actually is. Eric Stewart, who left his $190,000 a year job, has had five of his six students taken down, uh, six studies taken down after allegations that he fabricated information by altering sample sizes. Though Stewart has denied the allegations, his sixth Sixth study, conducted in 2020, drew the attention of an FSU committee who gathered to discuss Stewart's finding per the Daily Mail. Now, he apparently had done this study that suggested that there was a correlation between black and Hispanic population growth and then longer criminal sentences for black and Hispanic people. Now, he had done this study with a partner by the name of Justin Pickett, but Justin Pickett 
later said the original uh, information revealed that there was no correlation between population growth between these groups and heavier prison sentences based on the original unfabricated information that they had brought together. Now, Pickett apparently published his own paper and addressed the errors made in the joint paper, some of which was reportedly added just before publication per the report. Pickett says, quote, the data were so altered intentionally or unintentionally in other ways, and those alterations produced the article's main finding. Funny, funny. Now, I wonder how often this is happening with research studies. I'm not go- going as far as to say there are others for I haven't read others, but I have a feeling there is a large incentive to push the narrative that racism exists on a much larger scale than it does in this country. And I'm not going to get out here and tell you that racism doesn't exist in any form. There are, of course, people with small minds all over uh, this, this great nation. And so long as race exists, racism will probably exist in some form. We are humans who think in patterns, and we also love to think tribalistically. So race is easy to see to the human eye. There will be many of us with small minds who view others of different races and make judgments about their quality based on nothing more than their skin color. But there's not as many people doing that as the left would like to think and certainly not as many as they would like to push in their narrative. And this story out of FSU is quite telling. You know, you would think Eric Stewart, this professor who is now gone and disgraced for having fabricated these studies, you would think he'd be overjoyed at the finding of no correlation between the growth in black and Hispanic population size and then growth in criminal sentencing. Wouldn't that be something that you would be rejoicing in, taking to the streets dancing? If you believe that this country was systemically racist and that specifically our criminal justice system was keeping down black and Hispanic people, I would be tap dancing in the street if I did a whole study and found out that that wasn't the case. Ringing the bells, trying to let the entire black and Hispanic community know, guess what? At least in the area that we've studied here today, this is not happening to you. Isn't it so great to feel relieved of this narrative, relieved of this perceived oppression? But no. Instead, Eric Stewart said, hmm, let's just go ahead and fudge the numbers here. (laughs) Let's switch things around and then continue to convince people of their own oppression. Now, I can't fault Eric too much because that's something I would have done not even four years ago because I was just so utterly possessed by the idea that I was oppressed and wanted nothing more than to convince other people of that being the case. But I'm just glad that somebody had the wherewithal and the drive to call him out on this and to say this is not okay and then to then go publish his own study. Now, it might have been for selfish reasons. Justin Pickett probably would have been implicated had it been found that this study was falsified and fabricated and he probably had to get ahead of that curve. But nonetheless, he came out and said, this is actually not what we found. Racism is not as prevalent as we deemed it to be in this study. And it really makes you think, where else is this happening? We have the other stories. We've got the Bubba Wallaces. We've got the Jussie Smollett's. Uh, we've got the people who've you know, spray-painted swastikas and the N-word on, on college campuses who end up being African-American students or janitors or disgruntled employees. Recently, I did a speech at BYU, Brigham Young University, and they were shaken by a race hoax at a recent volleyball game. The BYU students went to play, I believe, against uh, a Duke, I believe, and a volleyball player came out and said, you know, I wanted to play. But these people were calling me the N-word over and over. I was being called the N-word and racially attacked. And it ended up a student was taken out of the volleyball game and, you know, thrown out. That student ended up being a a special needs uh, young man. And they ended up doing this full investigation because, of course, we take racism very seriously. And guess what they found? No evidence of such a thing occurring. None whatsoever. So why is there an incentive in telling these stories and identifying with acts of racism that did not happen? Is it maybe because 
oppression has become currency <laughs> in our society. And we are now encouraging people to identify with their oppression, whether it's real or fabricated. Could it maybe be that? Could it be that racism is an excuse for where you end up in life is an excuse for how bad you actually are as an, as a person and a crutch that you can use to justify just about anything. You guys want to get away scot-free with something you've done in life. Just accuse somebody else of racism. <laughs> say that they've called you the N word. Say that you're, they're a transphobe. Say that they're homophobic, you know, pull your black card and that will get you anywhere you need to go in life, apparently. And we are just reinforcing these ideas left and right uh, by giving them credibility and not going and retracting these stories when we find out that they're false. Everybody hears the initial story, the initial accusation of, of being called the N-word, the initial accusation of men screaming, this is MAGA country before they bleach you and put a noose on you. Barely anybody goes back to retract the statements they made when they find out the real truth. So we have to continue to call out these hoaxers. And this FSU professor hopefully never sees the inside of a classroom again because he has no academic integrity. If you want to get real facts in regard to this stuff, check out PragerU.com. And if you'd like to support the content we're making, go to PragerU.com slash donate. And we're back. I'm your host, Amor Benobi, your guest host for the day. We're going to take a call here from Glenn in Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Glenn. How are you? Hey, Amala. Um, I spoke to you before. Um, I had a question. Uh, look, look, a statement of what I do. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I found a way, in my opinion, to make Democrats look very stupid. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 so what I do is I ask questions to probe them, to get them out. Mm-hmm. I, I have an opinion that I believe people say things all the time that they don't believe. So somebody will tell me, it's, t- it's typically a, a, a minority. I, I'm, I'm Latino. So they'll, they'll tell me, you know, America is systemically racist, yada, 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 whatever. And I, 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 I run with it. And I say, okay, okay, mm-hmm. America is systemically racist. Okay. Did you get the vaccine, sir? And they, they'll usually say it was very prideful. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, it was like, kind of like a badge of honor. Right. Oh, okay, okay. Then I say, well, so hold on, hold on just a second. So you believe America is systemically racist. But then you'll turn around and get a, a, a vaccine from that same government that you tell me is systemically racist. Like, if you really believe that, sir or ma'am, wouldn't you want to abstain and get as far away from the vaccine as possible? So then I look at them and I say, you don't really believe that. Come on. Mm-hmm. If you really believe that, actions speak louder than words. And so that is a perfect prime example of what I use to basically show people that they don't believe what they actually say, if this makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, Glenn, and thank you so much for that call. It's it's really, really powerful to just use questions to lead these people out into the open with their own arguments and force them to grapple with what it is that they think. Because when you ask somebody a question, it's not necessarily threatening. You're not coming at them with a statement. You're not telling them how to think. You're not even asserting how you feel. In fact, you're just going and trying to understand why it is they believe what they believe. And in asking questions, like I said, you'll draw them out into the open where they have to grapple with the very things that they think. And one, one of the questions that was asked to me, and Glenn, you just really reminded me of this. I was out door knocking uh, one day when I was probably 17 years old. And you know what campaign I was working on? I was working on the Andrew Gillum campaign in Florida. Oh, gosh, it just irks me to even think that I was door knocking for that man now that we know who he actually is and what's actually going on in his life. But yes, I was door knocking for the Andrew Gillum campaign against Ron DeSantis. And I knocked on the door of this Cuban-American guy and he came out and immediately I was just outwitted for for miles by this man because he'd come to the United States and, and got citizenship and had to study this country and, you know, develop a reverence for this country, which he already had, uh, having come from Cuba and really revering American culture and history. So he came out and said, oh, I would never, I would never vote for Andrew Gillum. I said, why? He said, well, well, I'm a constitutional conservative. And he told me about how he came from Cuba and what the conditions were like in his country and started going off about how 
so many complain about the conditions here in America. Yet the people who are complaining the most are those who are advocating, handing over all resources, all power and all control to the government. And if the government it has this really heavy hand in oppressing you and holding you down systematically. Why is it that in the very next breath, you are advocating that they control virtually everything it is that you do in your life? And that's a hard question to answer. It really is. If you truly believe that the government is evil and out to get you, or at least that there are nefarious people working within the government who are evil and out to get you and are racist and transphobic and homophobic and sexist and all of these things, why would you be in the next breath fighting for these people to garner more power? You know, and these are questions that at the time I didn't have to answer. And I was under this cult-like mindset of, you know what? How dare you? I shouldn't even have to answer the question of somebody who's a bigot. Why should I even listen to the questionings of, of somebody who I believe to be bigoted and racist and all of these things? But... Those questions were seeds planted. And though I was not ready to confront them at the time, and I was not ready to grapple with them at the time, I remembered those questions a year down the line when I was ready. So when we're going into these arguments or back and forth with people, questions like the ones Glenn just posed are very, very powerful. And you might not win in the moment, and it might become a heated battle, or the conversation might just go nowhere and you never get an answer to that question. But you better believe that those people are walking away with that in their brain somewhere, and they're going to carry it with them. If you want to know more about questions you can ask leftists from a former leftist herself, check out my show, Unapologetic Live, and find me on PragerU.com. I am your sitting host, Amala Epinobi from PragerU. We're in our last hour here, so I'll, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm a former leftist now working at PragerU, hosting a show called Unapologetic Live, which you can find on all podcast platforms. And you can search my name, Amala Epinobi, on social media to find me anywhere where you get your social media. I figured to start off this last hour, we'll take some calls. I want to hear from Payam in LA, California. I hope I said your name right. Hi, how are you? Hi, good morning. Yes, you said it perfect, Amala. You're doing fantastic and you rock. Thank you so much. Thank you for getting my call. Of course. Uh, so uh, I wanted to share something, you know, uh, as far as uh, in business, friends, I do wor- deal with a lot of people that are liberal, as mm-hmm. you know. And liberals, they're naive, they're misinformed, unfortunately. But the same liberals, especially California and states like this that are voting for these leftist, Marxist, and these everybody that they don't stand for anything that the country stands for. Mm. I'm, an, I'm a legal immigrant. I'm a refugee myself. I'm a, uh, from Iran. I came here for the land of freedom. What I found out, I wanted to share with you something that what you were talking about, I realized, similar to the five-minute videos, if there are just two-minute videos that says, if you vote Democrat, you vote for this. And take every single point and make a short video of that. And then at the end, put a conservative alternative. So people, they know, these liberals, they realize what they're voting for. And their values, they actually align with conservative values more. And they realize they were duped. This is not the same party that they used, their parents used to vote. And if you guys with resources that Dennis uh, and everybody has, they could be able to create it we can gradually wake up the liberals and save the country. Ah, thank you so much for your call. I appreciate that. So I I do think there is certainly an, an idea there in sort of trying to show people where the real risk lies when they support these policies and where when they support 
these things that maybe sound great, diversity, equity, inclusion, acceptance, tolerance, these things sound great, but can lead to really horrific outcomes. I mean, unfortunately, with the state of PragerU, we're not allowed to tell people uh, how, how to vote. And actually, I think that's quite fortunate because we, we focus on the, the foundational values behind why people think what they think rather than getting involved too much in the political battles and woes of, of today's time. I think when you leave people with values that last far longer than telling them exactly how to vote, but I think there is something there in that we need to distill down just how harmful some of these ideas are and show the real people that they are affecting. We spent the first hour talking about gender and specifically its relationship with children and the transgender movement, and what has been so powerful for me, I think, and for other young people who have been thinking about this issue and going back and forth about how they feel is hearing from people who have been negatively impacted by the ideology, hearing from people who uh, are detransitioners, hearing from those who attempted suicide due to this blind affirmation of delusion. And when you can distill that down, because our attention spans are so small now, into a couple minutes, it's a really powerful thing to do. So I am, I'm with you on that being, that being an idea there. Uh, we're going to take another call from Domingo in Dallas, Texas. Hello, how are you? Hello? Might have lost that one. Let's hear from one, Robert two, Niels. You <laughs> Robert Niels in California. Hi, Robert. Hi, how you doing? I wanted to comment on your remarks regarding turning stuff off and not getting any input, any noise. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm at home. I'm retired, so I get radio all day long or YouTube or something. I have to have background noise. Mm-hmm. But every once in a while, I have to take that walk out in the desert. Fortunately, I'm close enough to do that, where there is no noise, no people, no traffic, no anything. It's just just me and my thoughts. Hmm. And be, being able to have that quiet, that quiet is very important. Yeah. But also, also no. On uh, one of your just previous callers, is like get these people to listen to what's going on, but at the same time. I'll watch CNN just to see what they say. Mm-hmm. I need to understand what they're getting and thinking so I can talk to them properly. This is what you heard, and this is my voice on it. Right. But, yeah, I, I, I love your idea of get in the quiet. Find that quiet place where you can go. No radio, no computer, no 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 iPhone, no nothing. It's, it's important. I love that. Thank you so much, Robert, for your call. You said something really important there. That, yeah, on, on two different notes, you're listening to CNN. You are getting to know the people who you disagree with and getting familiar with their arguments, which I find is not something common for people who are on the left. They just shut down the people who they don't want to hear from, and they don't get accustomed to their arguments in any way, shape, or form. And that is a very, very horrible strategy. If you're going to go up against these people in conversations and attempt to debate, on the note of you finding that quiet place in your day that is such a wonderful thing to hear i'm just smiling to, ear to ear hearing that uh, you're out there doing this it just reminds me of being a child in that that childlike wonder that you have when when you're young of just being able to be anywhere in complete silence and letting your imagination run wild, being able to just come up with ways to entertain yourself, to think, to get to know yourself. And you, unfortunately, I think, lose that as an adult sometimes. And of course, technology has not helped at all. It is not lost on me that you said you're you're listening to the radio, you need background noise, and, and technology is providing that for you. And I think so many people are dealing with that. And I wonder psychologically what that does to an entire society of people that are constantly overstimulated by technology and noise and what it would be like to have that stripped away. Just imagine an electromagnetic pulse. (laughs) It's the United States of America and we're no longer able to quell the the thoughts that we have and we're, we're sitting in silence. I wonder what that would do to us psychologically. I can't imagine that it would be good. I imagine there would be a lot of distress there. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear from Domingo. He is back on, on the call here. We didn't want to lose him. Hi, Domingo. Hello. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Well, I just wanted to comment what you were talking about. Walmart taking a, a bubble. Yeah. Financially. Yeah. 
Um, there's a lot of inside cap going yeah. on there. What about that? Go on. Uh, well, just to put this in perspective, you remember when we had that um, uh, uh, the water shortage and the toilet paper thing? Yeah. Okay. These people that work at the store, they were hoarding that and selling it. Hmm. Okay. What do you mean by that? You they were they were, you know, taking the supplies. Is that what you mean? They they weren't putting it on the shelf. Ah. Okay. So how do you think that contributes to the the closings? Well, the thing about it is, what else are they not putting on the shelf? Hmm. Okay. And you think that's contributing to the loss of the the tens of millions a year? Some sort of internal mm-hmm. structure. Exactly. Hmm. It's always it's always closer than you think. Interesting, Domingo. Thank you so much for your call. I, I hadn't thought about it that way. And as I said, you know, I it, it's it, we always I think are off on the wrong foot when we attribute something solely to to one catalyst. And I, I don't think that leftism and, and all the laws in Chicago are the the sole bearers of responsibility when it comes to those Walmart closures. And I'm sure there could be other factors that are taking place there and maybe some internally as uh, is is often the case when it comes to businesses clothing. Uh, it's it's interesting. I'll be curious to hear more and see if uh, the Walmart executives come out and are giving a more detailed report as to why they are closing down these stores. I want to go back before we close out this segment to that conversation that I was having with Robert about sitting in in silence and having those moments. For those of you who know me, you know I'm a major fan of Mr. Rogers. I grew up on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood as a young kid and just watching the lessons that he uh, put out on TV. And if you do anything or watch anything, per my recommendations, it would be won't You Be My Neighbor, and a documentary on the life of Mr. Rogers and what his endeavors were in TV and why he chose to start doing children's shows. And we'll maybe talk about this more in the next segment because I could rant about this man for life. <laughs> but Mr. Rogers uh, spoke about when reading books, those spaces in between paragraphs that we so seldom acknowledge, we just read and read and read and we ignore that space in between paragraphs. He said that In moments when he was sitting and reading books, when he saw those spaces in between paragraphs, he would sit to reflect on what he had just read and what he had just learned. And we'll talk more about that in the next segment. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beautiful wood. A neighborly and day we're for back. Beauty. Good morning. Oh my gosh. I am so Could consumed with happiness just in hearing that theme song from I've Mr. Rogers. When I was a child, uh, we had this little fold out table at my grandmother's house, and we would finish uh, school and come home and put a blanket over this foldable table, hide underneath it, and watch Mr. Rogers on TV. And what a message that man gave to young children all across America. For those of you, who won't take the time uh, to go and watch his documentary. Let's dedicate this segment to Mr. Rogers. I'm going off the rails here. Mr. Rogers was this amazing man who just had a deep love for for children and just a deep acknowledgement that children's minds are so moldable and that they are absorbing everything around them like sponges. So they needed something good to absorb, something wholesome to absorb. And he throughout his career, made that so abundantly clear in the messages that he put out each day on television. There was a moment where Mr. Rogers was watching TV, and this is back when televisions were just becoming prominent in American culture, and he had turned it on and saw these two clowns on on television and throwing pies in each other's faces. And this was slapstick comedy at the time that people were, were loving and thought was so funny and children were sitting and, and giggling at as they, as they watched TV. And this struck a chord with Mr. Rogers and not a positive one. And think about 
seeing somebody throw a pie in somebody's face on TV. Mr. Rogers had the idea, this is violent. Children should not be exposed to this. Now, from that time when Mr. Rogers had that idea, think about what now children are watching on television, how violent everything is that is showing up on TV and how desensitized our culture at large is to violence. He was thrown off by a pie being thrown in someone's face. And he said, somebody has to do something about this. And he recognized that television, just all on its own, was such a powerful tool. When, you know, besides radio, could you have such a vivid, visceral message be displayed and broadcasted out to the American people so quickly, just instantaneously? And he thought, well, somebody needs to take on the torch for, for children. And he decided to do that and did... I mean, hundreds, if not thousands of episodes of, of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood where he tried to give these wholesome messages to kids to talk about how they are special and should accept themselves, but should try to understand themselves and should learn about how to interact with other people, how to build friendships, what bullying felt like. And he would take on these major news stories. I mean, stories of war and death and despair and somehow find a way to communicate to children in a way that made them feel better about the situations that they'd be hearing about in school or through mom and dad at the dinner table. And where is that energy for children nowadays? I'm looking at Disney, I'm looking at Nickelodeon, all these major networks that are creating televised content for children, and they are simply using them as propaganda machines. They are thinking not, how can I protect the minds of children? How can I fortify the minds of children so that when they go and encounter the real world that is not as cushy, they have the critical thinking skills, they have the morals, and they have these deeply set values that they learned from what they watched to take on any obstacle? No, they don't think like that anymore. They think, here are these young minds that are ripe for the picking as far as in convincing them of, of my ideology and my worldview and what I believe to be correct, how can I inject that into our shows? Which is why Disney and Nickelodeon are showing, you know, pride parades and talking about gender and racism and microaggressions to young children. I mean, just gone are the days of wholesome content and, and the Mr. Rogers type view on child's minds. And it needs to be reinvigorated. It really does, because children are losing their innocence in so many ways. I can't believe we're having conversations about what children can consent to, rather than having conversations about how we protect them, and how, in this world of ever-changing technology, do we keep children's minds safe? Make sure that when we do sit them in front of the television, they have something wonderful to watch that is going to appeal to that sense of childlike wonder. I mean, oh, to have the mind of a child again, <laughs> where everything is new to you, everything is fresh, you're so open to new opinions, you're not jaded to the world anymore. You have that beautiful sense of naivete that now so many people are just using to their own benefit. And children are being robbed, quite frankly of their childhood experiences and what a horrible thing to be robbed of because how many of us that are young adults now or older adults now <clears throat> look back so fondly on the times we had as children is this generation going to get that because when i think about what these kids are going to have to look back on it's going to be what ipad screens and iphones and social media and what cocomelon those those really strange child shows that they're watching today where they're going to remember not mommy and daddy playing in the yard with them and building memories with them, but mom and daddy shoving phones in their faces and recording their every move and posting them on social media. These are going to be the core memories of children. And when they grow up and they're adults and we suddenly have an abundance of research on the horrific effects of social media, of screen time, of blue light on the human psyche... Are they going to feel robbed? Are they going to recognize that it's us, it's us, the adults, that did this to them? Even though we had people like Mr. Rogers to look back on, we had all of this historical sense of knowing what's good for children and how to project, how to protect them, and we just ignored it. Goodness me. <laughs> 
I feel like I sound like I'm 60 years old. I'm 22 talking about this right now because I think being born in 2000, I was right on the cusp of being part, a part of that generation that was completely robbed of everything when it came to having that wholesome childhood experience and luckily I didn't get that experience I grew up in the backyard I grew up making mud pies and fake cooking food and bringing it to my mother and playing with my siblings and having an imagination and staging up fake musicals and subjecting my family to my horrible singing at the time that's what I grew up doing and now kids don't have that how many times do you see kids going outside and playing you know, one great thing that I think was done during the Obama administration was the endeavors that Michelle Obama went on uh, with her get out and play opportunity that she she ran with. And I remember as a kid, I was eight years old when o Obama was elected president, that one day I turned on the television to watch Nickelodeon and the screen went black. The screen went black and a little text popped up and said, today is get out and play. For 30 minutes, this screen is going to be black. Go outside, children, with parents' supervision, and go play. Go utilize your imagination. Go be physically active. Will you ever see that in the history of television ever again? Would any major television network shut down their shows for 30 minutes when they have consumers ripe for the picking and tell those consumers to go outside and do something healthy for themselves? I'm going to place a bet and say that they won't do that. They're more concerned with profit. They're more concerned with indoctrination than they are with your own health and wellness. Let's bring it back. Let's bring back Get Out and Play, and let's bring back the real American childhood experience. All right. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are today. I'm your sit-in host, Amala Ethanobi. If you all want to hear more from me after this guest hosting day, although after three hours of talking, do you really want to hear more from me? <laughs> you can check me out by going to PrakerU.com. I also have a podcast called Unapologetic Live, which you can check out on all podcast platforms. Plus, I'm very active on all social media. Much to my chagrin, I'm very active on social media. We're working on that. We said that before the overstimulation. We'll, we'll get to it. Now, recently, I've been covering on my show this uh, Tennessee House of Representatives story featuring Justin Pearson and Justin Jones, who were expelled from the Tennessee House of Representatives. But it seems as though now that story has been laid to rest as all three involved in that very audacious stunt of staging a protest at the House of, of Representatives have now been reinstated and they're, they're back. So if, for those of you who weren't following the story, in the wake of the Nashville shooting uh, by Audrey at that uh, Coven, uh, Coventry School in Nashville, these three House Democrats at the Tennessee House staged a protest uh, while they were meant to be working and were quite disruptive during their session. And Justin Jones, Gloria Johnson and Justin Pearson were threatened with expulsion. Now, Justin and Justin, uh, Jones and Pearson, we should call them, are both two young black men who made it very apparent that their expulsion was due to their race and pulled yet another racism card like the other ones we've talked about earlier in today's show. And Gloria Johnson is a white woman. So Gloria Johnson ended up apologizing for her form of protest during work. And that's not to say that protest is necessarily wrong. You know, in America, we take pride in the fact that we allow our citizens to protest. But maybe you should not do that during work hours and you should follow the rules of the people who have hired you for the position that you're in and do your best to serve your constituents while you are meant to be doing your job. But Gloria Johnson apologized for the proceedings and survived while the other two were expelled, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson. Now, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson immediately ran with this narrative of, of racism. And Justin Pearson puts on a brilliant Martin Luther King Jr. performance as he imitates his voice by saying, Today we have lost democracy. <laughs> oh, it's just hilarious. You can tell these two grew up 
with just a, a love for social justice and a love for activism, much like I did, because that's something that maybe I would have done had I been a black man and not a woman. <laughs> I'm not too good at impersonating uh, MLK these days. But Justin Jones and Pearson were now reinstated to their positions, and I really don't know how I feel about it. For me, I think this reinstatement is reinforcing the idea that those who are loud get their way. And those who scream the loudest are the ones that are right. And that's all that these two men have been doing. They've been screaming. They've been crying racism. Although Justin Jones himself has uh, infamously been quite racist within the House of Representatives, referring to a person of color who happens to be a Republican within the House of Representatives as a brown face of white supremacy. That's what he called one of his Republican colleagues. So who exactly is, is being racist here? And if your Republican colleagues have, have many in their seats that are people of color, how exactly are they being racist by expelling the, these, these two black men for breaking the rules of decorum? The math is not mathing, as I like to say. The sense is not sensing. It's not making sense. But nonetheless, they've been reinstated course reinforcing the idea that if you are loud and you complain and you cry racism things will go your way and you will usher in your win for democracy as justin pearson calls it and what's really interesting about this story is people have gone and found old videos of justin pearson when he was in college talking about how his main goal is to actually promote political discourse to allow people to come to the table of all walks of life of all background and to be able to have a discussion about our most pressing and controversial issues it's interesting how his tune changed from that video in college and how he's now imitating mlk as if he's doing anything anywhere near as courageous or as brave as what that man did at the time you are not mlk you are not in the great race struggle of fighting jim crow in america because we don't live in a jim crow america as much as they would like to convince you otherwise that is not the great battle and they're not changing the world in the way that they think they are they are just reinforcing horrible ideas and i hope we as society go forward and say no we are not going to listen to those who scream the loudest. We're going to listen to those who come with a calm, cool mind and perspective who are so much in truth that they don't need to yell, that they don't need to be emboldened to bring their blood to a boiling point in order to drive through their point. Hopefully we move towards a future that looks more like that. our final segment of the day. It's been a pleasure sitting in and guest hosting for Dennis today. My name is Amala Epinobi. You can check me out by going to PragerU.com or searching my name on any social media platform. You will find me there. You know, producer Sean brought up an interesting point after the last segment about the prankster. I was talking about all this crazy content that's out on the internet. People eating, people crying, people detailing their anxiety, their gender dysphoria, these crazy pranks, these crazy challenges like the cinnamon challenge and the Tide Pod challenge. And Sean said, you know, how much of that onus is on the creator and how much of that onus is on the people who are choosing to watch the content? Because like I said, these people are getting millions upon millions of views. And Again, it brings me back to childhood. I remember as a child being told, you know, you are what you eat. And, you know, you give the old roll of the eyes as you stuff a fruit roll up in your mouth. <laughs> and now I think about that and go, you are, you are everything that you eat. You are everything that you consume. You are everything that you perceive and you take in. And all the energy around you is who you end up being, who you end up becoming. And it might not be a direct reflection. I might not watch somebody eat food on YouTube and then go, you know, gain 100 pounds. But all of that is absorbed within us. And everything that you take in in this life is going to be reflected some way, shape, or form back at you and back into your life. Now, it's sort of a leftist hippy-dippy thing to say protect your energy. But it is so important to protect your energy every single day of your life. My grandmother, uh, who I love so dearly, says something really important. She said it all throughout my life. And it's that you in, in, in life, there's so many things that you can't control that just simply happen to you. But you can control your reaction. You can control the way you go about maneuvering in, in this life. And Anything that is within your control, you should hold on to and protect and keep near to your heart. And that energy thing is so true. 
you know, we talked about overstimulation earlier and this constant need to be having noise and hearing something and this incessant drive to not sit with one's own thoughts. Sit with your thoughts and find out what is your, what is your energy? Who are you? What is it that you're in fact protecting? Because if you don't have a love for that or an understanding for that, so much junk is going to enter your brain all the time. And we are what what we perceive and what we take in. So protect your energy and try to be positive. We talked about a lot of very dark things today and it can take you down and it can take away your sense of hope and your sense of, of optimism. But you are always you and you're, you're here sitting here with your own thoughts and those thoughts can be protected. Your positivity can be protected. And though I can't control much of the stories that happen in the news and what we talk about, I can certainly control my positive reflection on it and my positive attitude towards it. So along with the challenge of self-reflection and sitting in silence for, for 30 minutes today, protect your energy, everybody, because it will be the greatest thing you've ever done in life. Because when the worst things happen to you, if you have protected energy and protected positivity, you will be able to see your way through it. That's what I want to leave you with today. You can check me out on all social media platforms if you want to hear more from me. It's been a pleasure. Dennis Prager here. Thanks for listening to the Daily Dennis Prager Podcast. To hear the entire three hours of my radio show, commercial-free, every single day, become a member of PragerTopia. You'll also get access to 15 years' worth of archives, as well as the daily show prep. Subscribe at PragerTopia.com.